Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with jazz guitarist Reza Bassi. These days he is promoting 2017's Unfiltered Universe. He was born in Pakistan, and at four his parents moved him to the vast beauty of Southern California. He went on to study at the University of Southern California and the Manhattan School of Music. For the past 25 years he has called New York City home and played all over Europe, Canada, U.S., Mexico, and India. He has shared the stage with the best, and he has been a part of so many projects. So please get to know him and dig this interview, my friends. Rez, thank you for taking a minute out for me today. I appreciate yeah, it. No problem. Thank you. So let's go ahead and, and dive into the biggest thing probably in your universe is Unfiltered Universe. Talk to me about the newest <laughs> album. It's a trilogy of um, three albums uh, with this particular group, and this is the third one of that trilogy. And uh, it uh, two of those were... were uh, granted and commissioned by uh, Chamber Music America, so that really helped get that, you know, uh, galvanize the process of writing for this, for both these uh, these particular albums that were commissioned. So it started in 2008 with this group, and you know, I do call it a trilogy, but uh, hopefully, you know, maybe there might be, maybe I'll expand that to uh, four four records one day when I when I realize how great the this band is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when I continue to realize how great this band is, I already know that. Yeah, it's dangerous calling it a trilogy because then it's like kind of closes the door on certain aspects of it. So, Well, the way the American consciousness works, though, is when you say trilogy, people say Star Wars, and they are like, oh, well, there's going to be more. <laughs> or, or there's a before. Yeah, that's true. The European audience probably thinks, well, and the whole world probably thinks that when they hear trilogy, but uh, that's not a bad uh, connotation to have, actually. <laughs> sure. I agree. I mean, especially when you're talking about, you know, unfiltered universe and all this kind of things. So it fits. It's nice. very thematic, for sure. How do you feel with not only the completion of the trilogy, but just the sound and the feeling you were going for? Did you capture it? Oh, yeah, most definitely. I mean, you know, I uh, when, when you say capture it, I mean, not everything is the first take, right, in the studio. where We perform, basically, in the studio, and uh, I like to, you know, take a few passes at each tune and uh and not you know not every tune that i use was the first cut so uh so it's it's nice to have that luxury you know uh, overall i i I absolutely kept i end up catching uh catching anything that i uh that i uh, you know my imagination um you know was was dealing with at the time and afterwards i listened to every cut and say which you know feel out which one's the best and yeah, so uh, I, I would never, in other words, in a nutshell, I would never release something that I, I felt that didn't actually capture the magic. Right on. And, and luckily, because of the luxury of the studio, I have that ability to, to, to say, no, that, that cut didn't work, but this one surely did. You know, and we're only human, you know. <laughs> yeah, but that is out. Yeah, not every solo is going to be, you know, that we play is going to be the, you know, the best thing on earth, so. Without a doubt. But, um, you come here from Pakistan at the age of four and go to Southern California. Talk to <laughs> my, my parents came, yeah. My yeah. parents dro- dra- dragged me out to, to the United States when I was four, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to me about that transition in your life. How, what was it like to go from two vastly different cultures? You know, look, I was four years old, so we, I think in that realm of time, you're really a child no matter where you are, unless you're in some kind of war-torn country, which obviously that's happening all around the world, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, I I wasn't part of any war at that time. You know, coming when you, to the U.S. when you're four years old, I, I think everything's just like, you know, like a, a big fairy tale at that time. So I, I can't really remember, like, juxtaposing those two cultures. You know, as as I grew... You know, I, I had cousins and, and and whatnot that were still in Pakistan, so I would go back and and, and you know uh, visit them for months or weeks and months at a time, and that sort of uh, instilled this this culture in me, and that's when I realized that it was there was quite a big difference between um, you know that world and the U.S. And it was far beyond just McDonald's. <laughs> and so, yeah, and, and, and that, you know, so there obviously is a big difference. And it's not something I grappled with. It's just something I embraced and accepted. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, 
I would say I grew up as a really an American. I mean, in California, did, did all the things that Americans, well, a lot of Americans do near the near the ocean. I surfed. I happened to be near the ocean, so I surfed. I did motorcycles. I played rock and roll. You know, these these are these are things that you do in California. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then and then of course the jazz bug hit me, and then that that, that turned a new leaf. Well, let's talk about that jazz bug. When did that happen? Why did you pick the guitar to be your jazz vehicle? Well, I, I already uh, was playing the guitar uh, from 11 years old, um, and, and jazz. I, I discovered jazz when I was around 16, so it was already you know I was already technically uh, adept at, at playing the guitar because I was playing. Uh, you know, uh, tunes from people like Van Halen and Rush and Led Zeppelin and, you know, these kinds of, you know, high tech guitar, uh, bands. And so, uh, so my physicality on the guitar was, was fine already. Um, and so with, with jazz, it was a, a, it was more of a vocabulary and aesthetic, uh, choice that, uh, influenced what I was doing, um, physically on the guitar. So when I was 16, I, I, I simply, you know, um, uh, I, I ran into a friend that was actually a rock guitar player who was starting to study jazz, and I just found that intriguing. And, and the fact of the matter is, the next year I was going to college, or the next year or two I was about to go to college. So you you don't go into college as a rock major, <laughs> you know, or anything like that, or a pop music major, not generally. So um, so there was jazz and classical music, and I thought, okay, do I go into college for business or do I become a lawyer or do I continue this this whole uh, music endeavor and jazz was was not only something I love but also something I can pursue in uh, uh, I can pursue in college and that's exactly what happened so what musicians turned you on in the beginning when you started listening to jazz it's funny because the first concert I my friend the same friend took me to um was Ella Fitzgerald uh, at the at the Universal Amphitheater, which is really a big, big place, and uh, Joe Pass was on guitar. That just kind of turned my head, and I thought, "Wow, this 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 older gentleman, you know, is playing like all over the guitar." And I, and and you know, when you're young, tech, technique really does turn you on a lot. But you know, facility is like a big big element, especially when you're coming from you know people like Van Halen and and, and these type of uh, players uh, with monster chops. So. So yeah, I mean, um, uh, Joe Pass was definitely um, a head turner for me. And then another friend took me to see Alan Holdsworth, which is really on the other side of the spectrum of, of what we call, you know, jazz. If you see it as a large, uh, you know, colorful music, there, there's all kinds of like variants uh, within the jazz frame. And and that is what I that was sort of, sort of my education from 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 Joe Pass to, to Alan Holdsworth. That's where it sort of, sort of galvanized. And then obviously, uh, you know, once I got over the guitar spirit of things, I, I, um, discovered Charlie Parker right away, in fact, uh, um, you know, and that was another head turner. Um, and then I realized, okay, so, you know, there, there are all these other amazing musicians that, that uh, I have to look into other than guitar players. That's, you know, of course, Coltrane and, you know, it just keeps going. You know? Oh, and yeah. It continues to, it continues to keep going. Absolutely. That's the beauty of jazz, man. So you go to the University of Southern California and the Manhattan School of Music. What did you learn in a formal environment about music? What, what were the big things you took away? I guess possibilities of what, what you can what you can do um, as a as a jazz artist. I mean, there are a lot of different types of uh, students floating around at these colleges. Uh, some are very you know straight into uh, the the jazz vernacular of, of bebop, let's say. And then some are more free oriented, uh, like, uh, someone, the, they would listen to Ornette Coleman. And so it, it's sort of, and, and beyond, there's, a, you know, other, you know, the people listen to Lake Coltrane, you know. So th it's great to have, like, this community of, of musicians that are all eager to, to not only share, but, uh, um, you know, sort of represent what, what they're, what they're into. Um, and, you know, when we're all young, we have, more of an ego so hey check this out look this is what i like this is what i you know and and so i think school more than the believe it or not more than the actual education of it 
sometimes i think it's 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 also about uh, the community of the whole thing the collectivity of musicians all in one place uh, all the time you know uh, and we and you play with each other and and you know then you bounce things off of teachers which which is a great another great source and of course when i was going to school it was a different time i mean uh, you know now you have everything on youtube and you know uh, people teaching, giving courses on YouTube. I mean, it's 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 a really different time. I don't know. If collective ideas absolutely there for sure, but I think you can get plenty off of uh, off of you know the internet <laughs> where you couldn't do that before. So yeah, I don't yeah, know. How, I don't know. How, I don't know how uh, uh, schools are are dealing with that necessarily. So you know, I'm not sure what the paradigm shift is for them. Yeah, uh, in, in order to retain students and and, and and gain more students. Well, the one other thing about you is that you've been in New York for the past 25 years and it been is. home. It, it, is New York just a joy all the time to be a part of that jazz scene? Yeah, yeah, I, I, it definitely is. I mean, uh, I've always been a city type of person, you know. Uh, so, I mean, maybe for me, it's it's more than actually um, the the music. Uh, that is part of it for sure. But I just like the. The fact that there's people all the time, you know, outside walking around. And I mean, I'm from LA where you drive all the time to get even a coffee, right? Yeah. Um, so it's a very different, uh, uh, very different position I have here when I, I can just walk outside and just like, you know, hey, the, you know, it's like human contact. I always tell my parents it's much more real here, you know, that's yeah. why I moved here. It's like, I felt like, you know, I really feel the reality of what's happening. You see the homeless, you see, you know, then you see some guy on Fifth Avenue that, you know, is driving a Rolls Royce. I mean, you know, it's it's sort of like every the whole world's clash here. And uh, um, I think, you know, within that framework lies jazz, you know. I mean, there is jazz within just that, you know, whether you want to call it jazz or not, but it's the same spirit. Yeah. Yeah, um, but the you know, but the music scene, yeah, the music scene is that's also uh, an amazing thing. I mean, I don't go out nearly as much as I have before, also because I'm a lot more choosy now than I used to be. But uh, when I first first you know five years, uh, ten years, whatever, you know, I'd go out and hear uh, people like Bill Frizzell, and uh, you know, they were put, they would, they weren't as famous back then, so they were playing at local smaller clubs and, you know, with 15 people in the audience sometimes, you know, and it, it kind of amazed me at that, you know, thinking like that, but um, that the scene used to be like that. But now sometimes you can't even get in, into their shows. It takes a long process and a long line. You have to wait in to get in. But but so, you know, that, that was a great, great, uh, you know, thing to be involved in. Um, at, a, at a time when when people like Frizzell and, and Abercrombie and Schofield were playing small small clubs, and you could actually get in no problem. So, yeah, no, the city is definitely definitely uh, an amazing place for for any art form. In fact, you know, so over the years, you you know, you've been in jazz for a long long time. You play with a lot of people like Peter Erskine, you know, Tim Byrne, Billy Hart. Rouge Rash, the, the list goes on. And I want to ask you this. What have you learned over the years from these veterans and masters of the jazz craft that have helped you teach younger players that play with you? You know, it's, it's hard to compartmentalize that, actually. Um, you know, it, it's, it's uh, an in intuitive um, idea, possibly, that, that, you know, like you learn from these people and you can't really talk it out in words, right? You know, that's this is the hard thing. I mean, it's like, um, I mean, music already to try and put that in words is, is kind of a ridiculous exercise in the first place. You know, I mean, no one has told me anything. So, I mean, I remember Victor Lewis once said, you know, the great drummer, uh, I was I was giving him some excuses about my my uh, my playing or whatever. I was like, yeah, you know, it's so difficult. You know, when I was young, very young, and he's like, man, no excuses. You know, so, like he was like, there are no excuses. You got to make this happen. I can talk about excuses. On, on my drum set and, you know, how I can reach this independence, but I'm not going to talk about that. I'm just going to work on it. And so, you know, things like that, you know, you, you get those little anecdotal kind of ideas from, uh, from these, from these people who've been around and that, that, that those kind of things carry with me a lot. Uh, but in terms of music and, and passing it along to, 
you know, students, um, I think I just show up at a lesson and I give them everything that I have that I'm actually conscious of and, and hopefully stuff that I'm not conscious of, you know, that's where the, the there's where the, the rub is, the fine line. I don't know what exactly uh, I can say I've learned from any specific person. Um, I mean, of course, we're working with rhythms and melody and all kinds of things and you know, maybe maybe there are some stories that that you know that uh, stick. When they play, I I learn. Put it that way. You know, yeah. that's 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 about as as as, uh, as uh, descriptive as I can get with that. Yeah, that's cool. So let me ask you this: Why do you love jazz? I I think because it, it allows the freedom to be you, to be yourself. Once you try and sound like someone else all the time then you're doing yourself a disservice uh, and you're probably doing the music a disservice too, which doesn't live on its own. Of course. I mean, the music's only there because we're human and, and we're here doing it. Jazz allows us to, to bring in our own influences um, uh, regardless of what sort of time period we're living in, first of all, and, and what uh, maturity level where we are at, it, it, you know, it's, it's a mu- music of now. If I'm feeling this way right now, I can really explore that within the confines of jazz music. Um, you know, as a classical composer, I can probably do that too. But the thing is, it's a little different because then you have this piece of music that, that you know, you're, you're playing over and over again, the same notes and the same, same in, in the same manner. So, I mean, what if you were sad one day and the music's really happy? Like, there's a, there's a contradiction there, right? With uh, with with jazz, you know, you can play a standard and you know forget the lyrics and and play the melody and you can play it sad or happy right there, and and it really depends on how you're feeling at that that moment. That state of mind is is, is very much in the now. So that that's essentially in a nutshell what what I feel about uh, why why jazz is so great. Also on the on the other level is it's the cultural aspect of it that. Uh, that makes it so great. It's very open to, to um, you know, allowing uh, various influences. In, in in my case, you know, the Indian Pakistani influences. Um, you know, my wife's an Indian classical. Well, she's she's an Indian singer. She studied classical music. She does other things with it now. But uh, listening to her sing all the time and and. and play these particular ragas and scales. I mean, that just influences my music, my jazz. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You had mentioned seeing Ella, and when I think about live shows, I want to ask you this. If you could get into a time machine and go back in time and see a jazz musician live, where are you going to go and who are you going to see? He may be the biggest influence in my in my life, and, and, and actually most people's jazz life is John Coltrane. That's someone that wasn't alive when... when when I was conscious of jazz music, and you know, just the the spectrum of of how much he he did in, a, in such a short period of time, it's just uh, untouchable, really. And so, you know, he he would absolutely absolutely be probably the number one person I would want to go see and and just admire. And I would say probably is, in fact, his mid period which I, I think is you know more like 63 64 65 that's my favorite overall period of, of his and that's when i would want to uh, i would want to be into the, uh, you know like somewhere like the vanguard or something you know just to watch that would be beautiful for sure yeah um, exactly but uh i mean and there are there are others but uh, i think he's such a standout that uh this is really uncomparable yeah i agree so let me ask you this. Everyone has a version of who you are, your family, your friends, those that listen to you live and buy your music. But when you wake up and you face your day, who are you? Who do you think you are? Well, uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm essentially in the mode right now, and I have been for years, to actually try to forget about who I think I am, um, to be honest. Uh, my identity, uh, I'm, I'm trying to sort of put aside... And not not think about Reza Bossi too much. Uh, that can be very um, compromising in a way, and that could uh, stifling. I think constantly think of yourself as, as 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 a definition. You know, I'm very much into Hinduism and Buddhism and all these ideas, and I just feel like 
identity is something, you know, you have to be uh, sort of, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, light on, you know. I'm trying to lighten up my identity, quite honestly. Because, you know, we, we're, we're brought up to think that we're this and that and this. In society, there's so much subconscious stuff that gets into you from, uh, you know, through an everyday process of being with society and being stimulated by that, that uh, I, I want to bring more awareness to the fact that I'm not that. And so that's what I try to wake up with. I meditate every day and, uh, on, the, on these kinds of things. So Right on. I like that. I think that that was my final question. It was one of the tougher ones, and I think that kind of wraps everything up for me. Thank you for taking a minute out for me today. I appreciate the music, and I appreciate the stories. Yeah, Joe, I really appreciate it, and uh, good luck in Kansas and all that. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in New York, Europe, Kansas City, Pakistan, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Rez for his time, his music, and all those stories. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.